So are you still seduced by film? I love film, but no, I, I feel quite satisfied with what I've done in terms of theater. Uh, I, I've got to the point in my life at the moment where I don't necessarily want any huge new challenges. <laughs> that sounds, I mean, I will challenge myself, mm -hmm. but I don't want somebody coming at me and saying, would you start a theater in, you know, somewhere or other, or whatever the challenge might be. I, um, I'm in a more contemplative frame of mind, perhaps now. What we've never talked about in these interviews, and Mike mentioned it, is we've never talked about those moments when you can't go on. Either through the career is so disastrous, or you're in a depression, or you're in an artistic desert. Have you ever had one of those? I must have. I couldn't be, I, I, I couldn't have lived the life I have without having that kind of thing. But they've not been as important as they might be to some people or not been as devastating. Partially, I think, again, upbringing, that right. you were taught, you know, oh, God, my hand's fallen off. Well, I'll just put a rubber band around it, and then maybe I'll get to the hospital in three weeks. You know, that it's that I was brought up like that, that uh, you didn't give in to, to uh, feelings of, of the desert stretching in front of you. you. You got out of the desert. Do you have a thick skin or thin skin? Thin. Um, I get hurt. Uh, and I have been hurt quite a lot, but you somehow live through it. You, you, I mean, the first years at shore were very difficult. I got through those simply because I'd, put, I'd brought together around me, creating the ensemble in the early days, a group of such interesting people. I mean, when I talk about Heath, that moment with Heath, when I was playing Bell Rose and he was Cyrano and he gave me nothing, in fact, was sucking up energy from me. In the Bell Rose acting company, I was joking about it just three weeks ago, uh, well, Keith Knight, who just died, unfortunately, um, was playing the lead actor. The other actors in it were Tom McCamus, Nicola Cavendish, Stewie Hughes, and me. And oh we were just God. playing little walk-ons as the, the Bell Rose acting company. So, and that was 82, I think, at, at the shore. It was, when, it was the year, in fact, that they tried to fire me. But the people on the stage were fantastic. If, if Tom McCamus, Nicola Cavendish, Stewie Hughes, Keith Knight and me were this little kind of support group for Act One of, of Cyrano, imagine who else was out there. Joe and Benson and everybody, Marty, Geraint, were, we were all in this thing. And, and that was the production that came into the Royal Alex? Yes, yes, it was. So they tried to fire you yeah. for uh, the season that produced the production that came into the Royal Alex, yeah. which actually made it an enormous mark. Yes, yes. <laughs> I know. It was very funny because well, it wasn't funny. It was, it was hurtful. Um, having to fight that, it, it happened in the January that they tried to fire me. Cyrano opened in August, I think. Right. And I remember the board meeting, actually, after that opening night of Cyrano, which was ecstatic. And uh, several board members wouldn't speak to me, I remember, as I walked up the stairs to the board meeting. Uh, and I thought, I remember thinking at the time, oh, you were part of the gang that wanted me out, and now you're having problems. You don't know quite how to respond to this. Um, it's where you go in the darkest moments, in the moments of most doubt or depression, or the world, the theater, or the audiences have no need to see anything that I might create. It's where do you go in those dark moments? I mean, did you have any moments of doubt when they were going to fire you? Or oh, was yes. it just, I'm going to fight right back? Yes. Well, you're asking where do I draw the strength from mm -hmm. to do it through? I think it's in, I think it's in art. I, I draw strength from art. Uh, I've, I came from a family which collected pictures and you were meant to listen to music and you were meant to read books and that we weren't a religious family at all but we were art was important the creative arts and I draw strength from that 
I, I, from a painting or a everything that things have been made, books. I like reading. I like listening to music. I, I, I like. I like finding shapes in the music. I like following the, the logic of a musical argument. This helps me, and if, if I can find that, I sometimes can come back to my own work. I think that's where I gain it from. Favorite I, composers or composers that touch you the deepest? Well, you see, that's a very difficult question for me. I tend to go back to Haydn all the time. Um, but I used to laugh at my father. Haydn was my father's favorite composer. I used to say, oh, Dad, that's ridiculous, just tinkly tunes. My father would always say, no, yes, he can write tunes, and he's got jokes. That's what I like in music. And I'd go, oh, God. Um, <laughs> but in fact, I've come back to, I've come back to Haydn uh, in some ways. He does write tunes and follow logical patterns, and there are jokes. There's very, he's the most human composer. but. What I, I tend to be one of those people who co collect the remotest composers. One of my favorites is a man called Sir George Dyson, who everybody has completely forgotten. No, I know. He was, he, was, he was principal of the Royal Academy of Music in London in the 20s and 30s. And he was completely forgotten. He wrote, he wrote a good symphony, he wrote a wonderful violin concerto, and he wrote lots of oratorios and things, which everybody did at the time. But it's the symphony and the, and the violin concerto by Sir George Dyson, which are wondrous works, which got pushed on one side because he was writing in a, in a late romantic style. And in the ti that time, everybody else had come forward. Schoenberg had made all the changes. So I, I love people that are half forgotten, partially, I think, because I will be forgotten. And it would be lovely if somebody goes, oh, didn't something interesting happen in the 80s at the Shaw yeah. Festival? It's cavalcade. This yes, song. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they would go, oh, yes, that was all put together by maybe Chris Newton. Oh, yes, he was quite good for that little bit. And that would be nice to be remembered <laughs> for that. No, no, it really would. It's a, because our, our, our whole life is so ephemeral. It, it, yeah. I mean, any one of our performances or our productions, they can't be recreated. They just can't. It is the ephemeral art that we're in. Totally. The most ephemeral art of yeah. all of them. We use time to explain time a little bit. And because of it, we disappear, as time does. When you direct, is music in your head? I don't mean scoring the scenes with music, but I mean when you talk about jokes and music and structure and music and melody and music. When you direct something, are you informed by a, um, a musicality? Not consciously, but I, I find it's a little old-fashioned. I like to use music. Well, for a time in the 80s and 90s, you know, the British directors wouldn't use music unless it was specially written on, oh, they wanted it clean. But I was always for, I always wanted to set a mood, you know, so music is there, whether it's incidental music or the music of a shape of a piece, yes, it is in the back of my head. But then you see, so many things are in the back of one's head. This is why I ended up as an artistic director. I could control, I could control the space that the audience came into. I used to talk about, I used to talk about the gardens at the Shaw Festival all the time. Unfortunately, now they've got rid of the head gardener, so it's not personal anymore. But in my time, it was very personal because. I mean, you might hate the play, but you can't hate the gardens. So it's part of the surround. <laughs> you know, you, you bought your ticket, and it's, it's, you've gone on a long, dusty road from Toronto, and you've come down, and you've seen something, and you've gone, oh, it's not quite what I was expecting it to see. And we all do those productions. But at least you could go outside the theater and look at this wonderful expanse on the commons and see the ferns underneath the the pine trees, and it was, it was lovely shade and things, and you could go, okay, well, it's a pretty town, it's a very beautiful theater. And so your experience as an audience member was not entirely mm. wasted. You'd come to a, a decent place which treated you well. 